Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. The idea was simply, wouldn't it be neat if the Jamaican bobsled team used Evanston as a training base, as a hometown, a home away from home? It's amazing as, um, you know, Jamaicans on a whole are known for their hospitality. And I think that more than anything as I saw in Evanston, and the people there, they were as warm as we were in Jamaica. Rulon Gardner was the unexpected star of the 2000 Summer Olympics. He beat the unbeatable Russian wrestling Goliath and gave Wyoming a hometown hero. Well, now it's 2002 and the Winter Olympics are underway in neighboring Salt Lake City. So who do we root for in Wyoming? Well, how about Winston Watt? This city is a very nice place for like training ground. You know, it, it's far, it's not too far out of the town. It's, um, there are nice people here, nice facilities. The people here welcome us, you know, and um, the temperature is about what we, we wanted to, to get climatized with for bobsledding and, it's, and it's, it's, it's closer than a lot of places. But um, we love it here. The connection between the Jamaican tropics and the snowy prairies of Evanston may seem an odd one, but the oddity is compounded. To many people, bobsledding itself is strange. Jamming two or four people in a little plastic sled and sliding down a chute at scary speed with your head down so you can't even see. Never been in snow, never seen snow, um, you know, personal. I've uh, been nowhere where there was ever any snow. I've, not, I've never seen a sled outside of, you know, under the movie. And my first experience on a bob track was in Lilyhammer, which, to be honest with you, it was my first ride down. I was, I wondered to myself, <laughs> what am I doing here, you know? But and surprisingly. On my way down, that's all I was thinking. You know, what, I, what, am I, you know, what am I really doing here? After I finished, came out, take off my helmet, turn the sled over, I want to go again. You know, and I've, I've wanted to go again ever since. Clive is one of a succession of Jamaican bobsledders dating back to the 1988 Olympics, where the first Jamaican team competed and inspired the Disney movie, Cool Runnings. One of the members of that 88 team was Devin Harris. He says the movie was partly fictional, but caught some of the spirit. Let me just say that um, the, the movie, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was a, they did a very good job in depicting the spirit of the team as underdogs fighting to overcome the odds. Um, and I enjoyed it because I thought it was a really good human interest story, but that's kind of where the similarities end between real life bobsledders and, and Hollywood. Well, that's what they want, is to prove to the world they can do it. It is not a joke to them. They've appreciated the Disney coverage, but 
you know, they chuckle whenever you, as Devin says, which one were you in the movie? Devin always answers, I was the handsome one. And uh, that's about all they want to say about the movie. Paul Skog, an attorney in Evanston, was the one who imagined this improbable match, the Jamaican bobsled team and Wyoming. This was back in 97, I was uh, preparing for um, Nagano, and I got a call from uh, a lawyer, and I go, hmm, I didn't do anything wrong. Why is a lawyer calling me? Well, it was Paul School from Evanston, and he, um, this was in May. We came out in May 97 to, to see the town. I don't know what I envisioned in the beginning. I just simply envisioned uh, a team coming to town, maybe renting apartments or renting a house, um, and really just more the idea of more of a home away from home. Beautiful town, beautiful people, really warm, friendly atmosphere. And, um, you know, the, the, the town actually took us in, adopted us, you know, provided housing, um, does the facilities at the high school, made a makeshift sled for us. They adopted us, and we in turn adopted um, Evanston. And, you know, the love affair really started then and, uh, and has continued. I had no official sanction to be contacting them and offering the city of Evanston as a training base, but I thought that there were people here in Evanston who would give of themselves. Well, I guess it was about four years ago that the attorney here in town, Paul Skog, who has, who has built this relationship with the Jamaican bobsled team, uh, came to me and was sort of in a bind and needed some rooms for them while they were here training. Um, I thought it was a great opportunity for Evanston and, and myself, and they're always very good guys and very uh, uh, customer-oriented. You know, people relate to them, want to see them and meet them, and so I was more than willing to help them. It was a slow time in the hotel, and from that point forward, uh, it's just been a growing relationship to where we have sponsored them every year, every time they come up. I, I showed them around town. I showed them our high school facilities, which have terrific weightlifting rooms and running tracks. I remember one comment one of the Jamaicans made. We were standing on the track. It was a beautiful May day and uh, they were looking at it and it's a rubberized, uh, rubber coated track and he told me, he looked at me, he said, we have nothing like this in Jamaica. And I asked what the significance was and he said, it's easier on the legs. The rubber coating is easy on the legs and the knees. Now the Jamaicans did have something like this, and Evanston had a new image as an improbable but friendly host. That new image was welcome because Evanston hasn't always looked so good. In 1868, when the Transcontinental Railroad came through, um, established a camp uh, right across the street on Front Street and uh, pitched tent for the night, and sooner or later it, it, uh, it evolved to What's, what's known as Evanston. Evanston's, the name, comes from surveyor James Evans, who was working for the Union Pacific and came through and surveyed the town, actually laid out the grids and so forth, and it became known as Evanstown. And that's how Evanston, the name, came about. Soon after Evanston was established, we were, we were uh, identified as the county seat. And Uinta County was a huge county that ran all the way from uh, its borders on Utah all the way up to, to Yellowstone Park was considered uh, the Uinta County. That Boone area from the, uh, from the late 70s to the early 80s um, brought a lot of good and bad to Evanston. The, the crime came with um, all the man camps and the oil field workers and uh, of course the bars were, were crazy and there were stabbings and shootings and everything else. So, but with that and with all the money that came along with it, uh, a lot of good was developed in our community. With the boom of uh, the late 70s and early 80s where Evanston more than tripled in size, a lot of great things were, were came about because of that, the overthrust built and all the oil and gas industry that came to our community. Evanston's really become a, a wonderful place to live. The, the crime went away, but 
what the benefits we got from that, that big influx of dollars are evident today as you drive around town. In the summertime, it's, it's uh, cooler up here. There's, there's more to see and do. You're close to the High Uintas and Bear River Parkway and the rest of the stuff. So, you know, if, if it can be billed as a good, uh, wholesome western community and part of the state of Wyoming, uh, I think it'd be a great thing. Evanston, back as far as 98, um, took an aggressive approach towards the Olympics. Uh, Paul Knopf in the planning department put together a uh, master plan and a report, an Olympic report, uh, and presented to the council and ex explored uh, other cities that have hosted the games and how the outlying areas were affected and interviewed most of the businesses in town and, and, and got a feel for what they expected from the Olympics. So we've kind of used that as a template for, for our Olympic promotions. And with, with only being 45 minutes from Park City where most of those venues will take place and a little over an hour to Salt Lake City, um, Evanston's had a lot of success in its Olympic efforts. Our relationship with the Jamaican bobsled team started back in about 87 when, when uh, a, uh, a local lawyer watched a movie called Cool Runnings and was so taken by that film that he, uh, he just thought what a great fit with the 2002 Olympics coming up in Salt Lake City. Let's invite them here. Great, great place for them to train. Park City so close by and uh, they came. You know, to make a long story short, they, they ended up in Evanston and they've been coming back every, every year since then. And with, with a very warm welcome with the citizens. Um, the, the, the city of Evanston supports them in sponsorship. Um, you'll see great big letters, City of Evanston, Wyoming, across their bobsleds, which is like a, a traveling billboard. And, and the city has, has leveraged that relationship well. Oh yes, the Jamaicans. They don't need a lot of leveraging. They promote as easily as they breathe. And the people there, they were as warm as we were in Jamaica. Devin Harris is now training to be a spectator, and a new generation of Jamaican bobsledders is training in Evanston. And they're winning races. They're not a comedy act at all. We're showing the world that we're from the tropics and we can win gold as just as the guys that we live in the cold. Evanston's affiliation with bobsledding is really concentrated right here on Ross Street, where right behind me we've got the home of Paul and Jackie Skog, who invited the Jamaican bobsledders to come visit here in the first place. And then their next door neighbor, a kid named Joe Sisson, who got interested in bobsledding precisely because of their interest in the Jamaicans, and now is considered one of the most promising young bobsledders in the United States. And uh, met them when they came up for the soccer clinic, and then started training with them when they came back. And one of them said, have you ever wanted to bobsled? I can, of course. You know, and he said, well, oh, you're the perfect build for it. You should try it out. So he took me to the track. We went and watched one of their races. It was 97 America's Cup race. And I uh, helped him with their sled, all that kind of stuff. I had no idea what I was doing, but I helped him out anyway. And then they hooked me up with the right people on the U.S. team, on the junior team. And uh, I just kind of took off from there. Your dad told me it started even earlier. When I was, I think it was like probably third grade, um, my mom, dad, and I went to the Park City Nursery um, to get some plants. And there was a sign that said, future home of the Salt Lake um, Olympic bid bobsled and luge track. And uh, I'd been so excited about the games, perhaps coming to Salt Lake and all this stuff. And I remember running back to the nursery and uh, saying, Mom, Mom, do you have any pennies? And she gave me like two pennies and I ran back out there. And where the dirt was, I remember flipping two coins and making two wishes. So I'd tell you what the wishes were, but they'd never come true, so I can't do that. <laughs>
Uh, they started a new generation back in about 98 of some junior kids trying to build them up, starting them at the age of 16, 17, and then building them up into drivers. Um, I'm the only one that's still involved in that program, actually. I started when I was 17. Um, I'm 21 now. I've been driving for four years. The top drivers in the U.S. have been driving for six to seven years, but they started when they were 25, 26. Right now, I'm tied for fifth in the U.S. Um, the guy that I'm tied with is Quinton. The guy who's number two is Quinton. The guy who's number three is Quinton. And the guy who's number one and number four are up in the air right now. Both of them have said, I think I'm done and I think I'm coming back. So it's hard to say which one they're going to do. It's not Joe Sisson or the Jamaicans that you read about in the sports pages. If it's bobsledding, you read about the conflicts on the women's team, with star Jean Racine replacing her longtime brakeman. Or on the men's side, you hear about the brakeman on the first U.S. sled getting booted after a drug test. Sorry, I gotta take your prop. The big stars get the headlines and the sponsors. Not Joe, not Winston. So what I did, I go around, make a lot of friends, and the little money that we have, we, you know, pinch it here, pinch it there, you know, try to cut back on the expense. So we, and we try not to let stuff like that get us down. We know that there's no money, but that's a part of, you know, we have to fight through that and go out there and, you know, still execute what we're there for. Well, Bob said, I mean, how many people actually know who the top two drivers are in the, in the U.S.? you know, let alone the world. Um, it's a very, very popular sport in Europe, so they get popular. They have a waiting list for sponsors for the Swiss team. Um, we don't have hardly any. we got to go out and beg for sponsors. Um, it's very hard to compete like that. Bobsled is the second most expensive Olympic sport behind equestrian, and that's it, and that's only because the sleds don't eat. <laughs> you know, I mean, sleds cost anywhere between 25 to 45 grand. And uh, you got to have two of those, a two man and a four man. And then you got your runners on top of that, which is going to be five to eight grand a p for a set of those. And you'll probably have 12 sets of those by the time you get to World Cup winner status. Um, so it gets very, very expensive shipping sleds, shipping people, paying for people, all that kind of stuff gets very, very expensive. Um, myself, um, I borrow a sled. I offered them my old pickup truck to drive around when they came to town. What I gathered from that first meeting was, yes, they did need help, and they did need assistance, and they were appreciative. And I've become somewhat of a, a contact person, a, a, a scrounge, and I go and I what they need, is, I look for. And, uh, and that's what I've been pleased with, because when I ask, People in this town just give. And um, the Skog family, they are so good to us. There's no word to explain how good they are to us. And um, I have to include them in everything that we're doing right now. They backed us 100%, you know. And things that Paul did for us, um, I've never seen anyone did that for us. Leave, he's a lawyer, he leave his job, drive to Salt Lake City to pick us up, you know. Stuff like that, I haven't seen anyone done that for anyone yet. During the 2002 Olympic Winter Games, the competitors from Evanston are among hundreds that you won't hear much about and may not see on the leaderboard.
Evanston is only a short drive from the Olympic bobsled run in Park City. Strangely though, the Jamaicans don't train there. I don't know why. I don't know why. I saw some people there training today, but um, <laughs> unfortunately, I think they were Americans. I think they were Americans. U.S. bobsled officials decide who gets practice time on the track. And wouldn't you know, it's only the U.S. team. Everybody believes that the Olympics are kind of like a, um, head on a pedestal, I guess. Um, but it's very, very cutthroat. I, I've been down in the track in Park City about 550 some odd times. Um, he's probably even down at about 10, <laughs> you know. Um, anytime that he has any questions about any corners, I plan on talking to him about it. I plan on walking the track with him and showing him what I'm doing in different corners just to help him out. Um, he helps me out a lot on pushing, um, which like I said, was my biggest downfall and driving is his biggest downfall. Um, so if we can help out each other on it, then it should be all right. Joe is a, he's a very good kid to us. And um, he taught me a lot of stuff that I, 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 I didn't know about. As in Winston, his strongest point is push. My strongest point is to drive. Um, we always joke around saying if, if uh, we were combined as one, we'd be the top driver in the world. Because if I had his push, we'd be <laughs> turning some heads, definitely. I was going to race. This is, this is such a joke. I was going to race against Joe. Sisson in um, Lake Placid. And um, we're walking a trap one day and Joe said to me, hey Winston, you must do this, do that, and you mustn't do this here and you mustn't do that here. This is the correct thing you should do here. And I said to myself, why is he showing me and I'm going to race against him? First two runs, um, he crashed the second run, or the first run, I can't remember what, the first run, he crashed the first run. Um, I ended up winning the race by over a second. Second place was over a second behind me, which is a huge amount in bobsled. The first day I was going like three seconds faster than everyone, which is a huge margin where I crashed. I crashed and I still came fifth. Um, second race, first run, I drove absolutely horrendous. And with his pushes, I couldn't afford to drive absolutely horrendous. And he ended up beating me by over a half second in that one run. But the second day I the pushing has a lot to do in, in a race. And I, I started much faster than the rest of the world, as the rest of the teams was there. And um, I just drive well that day. And I watched him, I watched him what he did through certain curves that I was having problems. And I just go up there back and um, when I reach those curves, I, I just do exactly the same thing as he did. And, um, and then I came out on top. So he got me on that medal. Um, I got the silver. And that was kind of a shock by winning the race by a second and then coming in second. And uh, that was a shock. So then we had the, the grudge match at the end to see who was the, who was the better one. And I got him the first heat um, by, I believe, three hundredths. And that was it. And then the next heat, I got him by about two tenths. So I was pretty happy about it and, and uh, got a big hug at the finish line from him and everything. And we just laugh about it still. So. And then I sit down and... Um you know, think about this and said, you know what, this guy is a real friend of us. And um, it doesn't matter if we're going to race against each other, but he, um, you know, he's a big fan of us. I think the people of Evanston realize that sports is a competitive thing. Um, you don't have to be from the same team or the same country to like a team. I think they realize that within the Jamaican team, we have a good spirit. There is a competitiveness and we are very fun-loving people, very much like the, Ever the people from Evanston. And so they, they saw it fit to adapt us. They may not hope for us to beat the U.S. team, but that is one of our goals, to beat all the teams that we compete against. For me, the, you know, the the greatest thing that I can think of is to have a, an American and a Jamaican standing on the podium. I don't care where they stand on the podium. Uh, I always say there's plenty of room on the podium. There's three spots, Jamaican, American, and somebody else, and I don't care where. But that would be a great moment for me, for bobsledding, for America, for Jamaica. And Joe Sisson, well, he'll keep getting in his old truck and driving down the road for another run. 
dreaming a dream that a group of Jamaicans first dreamed in Kingston in 1988 and now dream in Evanston along Main Street, Wyoming. Shortly after taping for this show was completed in February, Joe Sisson suffered a major head injury while preparing for the World Junior Championships in Switzerland. When he was a boy, Joe went with his parents to Park City, flipped some pennies at the bobsled run, and made a wish. Well, now we send our wishes and prayers to Joe and his family.